Afternoon, everybody. Uh, by now, you should have all received the uh, statement from Resolute Support regarding the death of a U.S. service member today in Afghanistan. I wanted to begin by expressing the sincere condolences, uh, not only from Secretary Carter, but from all of us within the Department of Defense to the family of the service member. We are still gathering details on exactly what happened, but we understand that this service member died as a result of injuries sustained from an improvised explosive device while the individual was partnered with Afghan forces in Nangarhar province in Afghanistan. The mission was conducted as part of a larger U.S.-Afghan counterterrorism mission targeting ISIL in Afghanistan. The Secretary was briefed on the casualty and spoke directly with General Nicholson earlier today about it. Uh, again, the Secretary's thoughts and prayers are with the family of this fallen service member as well as the service member's teammates. The process of notifying next of kin is still underway and our operations against ISIL in Afghanistan continue alongside our Afghan partners. I also wanted to update you on the Department's preparations for the approach of Hurricane Matthew. Uh, this is a serious storm and uh, while we have not received any specific requests for assistance at this point, we do stand ready to provide support in the region as needed. U.S. Southern Command is standing up a joint task force commanded by Rear Admiral Cedric Pringle in anticipation of requests for support and is moving nine helicopters from Honduras to the Cayman Islands in preparation. The Navy is also looking at possibly deploying ships to include the George Washington, the Comfort, and the Mesa Verde if necessary. Over the weekend, approximately 700 family members as well as 65 pets were evacuated from Naval Station Guantanamo to Naval Air Station Pensacola using four C-17s and two C-130s. These family members will stay at Pensacola until it's safe to return. The remaining military and civilian population will shelter in place and be prepared to support recovery efforts once safe to do so following the storm's passage. The detention facilities at Guant Guantanamo can withstand the current projected storm strength and the 61 detainees there will shelter in place. If the storm should intensify, there is a plan in place to move the detainees to alternate shelters on base. And with that, I'm happy to uh, take your questions. Yes, Paul. Peter, uh, just a couple more questions on the casualty in Afghanistan. Is there any indication that he was specifically targeted or the Americans in the, in the patrol were specifically targeted? Uh, my understanding, Paul, again, that this was an improvised explosive device that was um, present uh, where they were in Nangarhar province, so I'm, I'm not aware of any indication this individual was targeted uh, specifically. Again, we're waiting to get uh, details back uh, from Resolute Support. This is still an ongoing operation out there, so uh, when they have more information, I know they'll be prepared to share it, and, and I have basically what, what they've provided already. But do you know that the IED was set off as opposed to, to a to uh, uh, detonate it remotely? Um, uh, honestly, Paul, I, I cannot say with certainty uh, right now based on the information I have uh, at this point. Um, but asking. I know that there were no, no other, uh, as I understand it, no other casualties um, reported. And just lastly, I've seen some reports in recent days of an intensification of ISIS campaign threatening others against cooperating with the U.S. Does this change Are you at talking all? talking Afghanistan here, or I'm sorry, in Syria. But in Syria. this is the the uh, press release from ISAF today said that this was on a patrol against IS Khorasan, right? Yes, that's right. Um, do you does this change anything in terms of of the way that that the U.S. is positioning or using its forces? And does this and does the same apply for any of its partners on the ground? Uh, obviously, this is a, a a tragic situation. We'll we'll wait to get all the the details. Um, but just uh, as a reminder, we have been uh, working, partnering with Afghan forces in this counterterrorism effort against ISIL uh, in Afghanistan for some time now. Um, this is, uh, uh, again, an offensive action against uh, ISIL because we do not want to let the, this group uh, be able to take root in Afghanistan as it has in other places. Uh, and we've had uh, success on that front with our Afghan partners and that was part of uh, this operation. And uh, we'll continue to target ISIL in Afghanistan and, and ISIL wherever it, it appears. And uh, again, this has been an effort that's been strongly supported by the Afghan government. Again, this was a partnered operation with the Afghans. Lucas. Peter, you call this offensive action. Can you say that this uh, individual was in combat in Afghanistan? Uh, Lucas, we've talked about this before. We are targeting ISIL in Afghanistan. We have uh, soldiers in harm's way. Uh, this clearly was a, a tragic situation. It highlights the risks that our service members are 
taking every single day in Afghanistan and, and elsewhere, and we've been quite clear about that. And this is, uh, again, an effort uh, to try and address a threat not only to uh, the Afghan people and the Afghan government, but, in the, but a larger threat uh, to the United States. And we'll continue to target and go after ISIL uh, wherever it, uh, it appears. And in this instance, it was in Afghanistan. But you can't say that he was killed in combat? Uh, this was a combat situation, uh, Lucas. Uh, clearly, this was, uh, this was a service member who faced risk um, alongside uh, Afghan partners. and. Uh, and again, we uh, uh, offer our condolences to the, to the family. This is a, a very uh, difficult situation. Um, but I think as the Secretary has made clear, uh, going after ISIL, wherever it metastasizes, including in Afghanistan, is an important uh, goal for uh, the Department of Defense right now, to protect the American people. And we're going to continue to do that, and this service member uh, lost their life uh, in that mission. And uh, again, we, we will await to get more details on exactly what happened here. Say what a branch of service this individual is from? Uh, I'm not going to at this time. Also, I'd like to go to Syria if anybody has more Afghanistan questions. Okay. Yeah, Carla? Um, just to clarify what you said earlier, no other U.S. or Afghan service members were wounded in this IED attack? That's my understanding. Um, was this, how many other and, U.S. And I should also point out, to the best of my knowledge, no Afghans were injured as well. And again, this was a partnered operation. The Afghans are, are there with us. And um, how many other U.S. service members were going on this patrol? Um, I, I don't have those details, Carla. And do you, can you give us a little more information on the time? Was this an overnight patrol? Was this a I, It was day? earlier earlier today. Um, so um, I don't have the precise time in Afghanistan. Again, these are the kinds of details that I know Resolute Support is working to, to, to obtain and to share that with you when they can. Um, but this was to the preliminary information they got from out in the field. Okay, I have a small question, but I'll defer back to Lucas first. Let me go to Tara. Um, was there any other enemy contact made, or was this just one IED explosion? Uh, again, these are those are details that I know Resolute Support is hoping to get a complete picture of exactly what's happening, and I, I'm not in a position right now to share all those details. I honestly don't know. Uh, so they'll be trying to uh, relay that to you as best they can. Um, but what we do know is that this individual was uh, injured from by an ex uh, improvised explosive device. Do we know by chance were they inside a vehicle or on foot patrol? Uh, my understanding is this was a, a foot patrol. Uh, they were not in a vehicle. But, but I, I want to be careful. Again, I'm getting this information from Resolute Support. And uh, uh, as you all know, uh, until we get a complete picture, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can say with certainty all these details. I'd like, I'd like for you to wait to, to hear exactly from them uh, what transpired here. On this? Well, Afghanistan. Sure. Uh, as you know, Taliban has mounted a fairly aggressive campaign or mission, whatever, in Kunduz. Can you just expand a little bit uh, uh, on the nature of what U.S. forces are doing there? I know they're serving in, in an enabling capacity, but mm -hmm. can you expand a little bit on that? Uh, I know that we have uh, enabling forces there that have uh, been uh, in support of uh, Afghan uh, security forces and uh, that it's the Afghan forces that have uh, retaken the city center and, and moved, uh, as I understand it, gathered control over Kunduz once again. So our forces have been in a, in a support role, but this has been Afghans in the lead and Afghans in charge of, of this, uh, this operation. Yes, on Afghanistan? Yes. Barbara? No, not on Afghanistan. Let, let's stay on Afghanistan for a moment. I'll come back to you. Before yeah. my question on in India, uh, Afghan people and the president is blaming that these terrorists, uh, you call them ISIL, Al Qaeda, or Taliban, they come across the border from Pakistan, keep going and coming back. The doors are open. How much you agree with that, and what role you think Pakistan is playing to uh, with the U.S. to fight against these terrorists in Afghanistan? Well, uh, as you know, we have a. Uh, ongoing conversation with Pakistan dealing with the issue of uh, counterterrorism and in Pakistan uh, shares with the United States uh, 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 the the threat of, uh, of terrorism uh, and I can tell you that in, in regards to, to these operations that uh, we have been in touch with uh, the Pakistani government about uh, the movement uh, between uh, these uh, across these border areas and that's a conversation will continue happening um, we think it's important for uh, 
both countries uh, and for all parties in that region to uh, address the issue of terrorism, and uh, we'll continue to make every effort we can uh, to work with our partners in the region uh, to address uh, that issue. Anyone on India? Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, these uh, um, recent attacks uh, on the Indian forces uh, in Uri, uh, but India is saying or blaming that it was the hands of Pakistan or Pakistan based terrorists which are wanted uh, or, uh, by the U.S. and India, and Pakistan is still supporting them. And uh, if the Secretary has spoken any uh, body in India or with the Defense Minister of India, or what are the views of the U.S. now as far as these tensions are very high between India and Pakistan now. Many are calling there might be a, another war between the two countries because these terrorists uh, <clears throat> attacking India one after another, and how much India can uh, tolerate, and enough is enough. That's what the view from the Indian people, and they are seeking U.S. support in this uh, uh, effort. Yeah. Well, uh, again, the U.S. officials I know have been in touch with both India and, and Pakistan. I don't have any particular conversations uh, with the Secretary to read out. Um, the one thing I would say is that we also are aware that the Indian and Pakistani militaries have been in communication with one another. Uh, and we encourage these continued discussions between India and Pakistan as a means to, to reduce any tensions that, that may be out there. And we're encouraged by that, and we certainly would encourage those conversations to continue. And any view from the Secretary that Pakistan is threatening with a nuclear war against India? Again, the Secretary uh, would hope, as the United States government would hope, that, uh, that tensions between Pakistan and India um, would be lowered and that there would be an effort at uh, communication here to try and uh, address uh, those concerns, and he uh, certainly a, a view that uh, he shares with others in the U.S. government. And just one more quickly, you think uh, uh, how much is this building knows that uh, these weapons in Pakistan could be or may be in the hands of uh, terrorists, uh, Pakistan-based terrorists, because they are the ones who are threatening also to use them against uh, across the border. Well, I think our our views on uh, on uh, the non-proliferation of of uh, nuclear weapons are clear. This is obviously. Uh, something that uh, this government and others around the world want to keep nuclear weapons out of the hands of, uh, of terrorists, and uh, that's something that uh, our views on that are quite clear. So. Uh, yes, I'll go Dan and then to uh, Barbara. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, on Kunduz, um, there's air power assisting the Afghan operations in the city. Um, can you provide any granularity on, on where U.S. troops are in terms of how they're supporting this? Are they working from the airport to coordinate airstrikes, anything like that? Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to get into the location of U.S. forces other than to say we do have enablers um, providing support to, to Afghan uh, forces uh, in the area. And uh, there has been uh, some air support. My understanding that there was a, a helicopter engagement, uh, air-to-ground engagement uh, in defense of uh, Afghan forces. I believe that happened uh, earlier today, uh, last 24 hours or so. Um, but beyond that, I don't have uh, I don't have any other indication about particular air support that's been provided. But we do have enablers there, as you said. But I want to be clear: this is Afghans in the lead. This is Afghans who have retaken um, areas that uh, where the Taliban may have been present in the last 24 to 48 hours. And uh, I know that the Afghans, I think they've said publicly that they feel much better about the situation in Kunduz today than they did say uh, 24 hours ago. There's uh, also Taliban pretty pretty strong Taliban aggression in Nawa and uh, Reju mm -hmm. uh in the Helmand province. Yeah. Uh, what kind of U.S. support are the Afghans getting with the operations that are underway there? Um, my understanding in, uh, in first of all, in, in Nawar uh, in particular, um, is that uh, ANDSF has re basically recovered the district center. It's now secure. Uh, ANDSF uh, forces uh, uh, carried that out. and. Uh, there are uh, strike a aircraft enablers in the area to support the ANDSF, um, but I'm not aware of uh, U.S. forces on the ground. Um, but airstrikes, I think, have been uh, in support of those ANDSF forces. Barbara. Two completely different topics, if I may. First, on Syria. Um, while the Defense Department has long said there's no military solution, alone for the ISIS situation or for the regime in Syria. Um, Aleppo is in dire straits. We know there have been repeated meetings in the, across the administration. 
about what, if anything, can be done. So what is Secretary Carter and this department's position right now? Are you still opposed to even limited airstrikes or military action to push the regime back from eastern Aleppo? Are you opposed to U.S. military action? Uh, again, Barbara, we, the focus for um, the Secretary has been uh, to support the U.S. government's efforts, Secretary Kerry's efforts to try and find a, a political and diplomatic resolution to the situation in Syria, the civil war in Syria, and that continues to be um, his position and the position of the U.S. government. We think there's still an opportunity for the international community uh, to do more to try and address uh, what is a humanitarian catastrophe in Syria. Um, and we certainly think there's more that the Russians and the regime can do uh, to try and reach that diplomatic and uh, peaceful resolution uh, as opposed to the, their current actions. And uh, so that will be, remain the focus um, for the Secretary um, and we'll continue to assess the situation and, and provide whatever counsel the, the President needs. I guess the question is, you know, even Secretary Kerry has publicly, even earlier today, expressed his dismay at the Russians. Uh, so how long, do you, how long does Secretary Carter go on with diplomacy? And my question really is, has he ruled out, in his mind, any notion of U.S. military action? Whenever, wherever, even if it's down the road, does he just simply pull that out and and reject that notion? Well, you know, Barbara, that the military focus, as determined by the commander in chief for the United States right now, is on ISIL in Syria, and that remains Secretary Carter's focus as well. We're continuing to make progress against ISIL in Syria, as we are against ISIL in, in Iraq, and uh, with regard to the civil war. Um, we continue to uh, provide uh, support for Secretary Kerry and his efforts. He continues to try and reach out to the international community, uh, even as we do not see much in the way of any response, positive response from the Russians and the regime to his outreach so far. Um, and with regard to, uh, I'm not going to get into hypothetical situations about the, the future, uh, but we continue to assess the very dire situation in Syria right now in terms of the civil war. It's a humanitarian catastrophe, right. and, uh, and the United States continues to, to urge all parties to try and reach a diplomatic and political resolution because we think that's the only solution for the Civil War. Can I shift to another subject sure. um, equally difficult? Um, I know that you don't want to talk presidential politics. To, everyone has made that abundantly clear. But I do want to ask you, there is now since the weekend, what can only be described, I think, as a national conversation among the veterans community themselves about whether or not people, veterans who suffer from post-traumatic stress simply cannot handle the stress of war. I don't want to box you in. I'm sure you're aware this was something that Donald Trump said, so I want to publicly make sure you, you're aware of that. But there is a national conversation amongst the veterans community about whether that is actually um, true, not true, insensitive, whatever you want to call it. So politics aside, what can you say about <clears throat> this department after 13 years of war and its understanding of post-traumatic stress and whether or not veterans, some veterans are simply not, to quote, not strong enough to handle it? Or is there something else about post-traumatic stress? Barbara, I'm, I'm, I'm going to disappoint you here because, you know, uh, the Secretary has made clear that we're not going to weigh in on the presidential race in any way. This is a very important topic, uh, the broader topic you talked about, but I'm not going to wade into uh, electoral politics and the comments from the candidates with regard to this issue. Um, if there are veterans groups who want to speak to this, I certainly encourage you to, to reach out to them. Um, for their views on this topic, but I'm just not going to wade into presidential politics. So I, and I appreciate you warning me that that's where this was coming from. So thank you. Yes, Cami. Uh, 
Can we ask you about the Russian missile system that's arrived in Syria? What can you tell us about it? What type of system is it? Um, I'm, uh, Kim, if you're referring to the, the Russian government's own announcement about a, uh, a system, uh, we're certainly aware of their, their announcement that they uh, plan to install a, a system in Syria, and obviously we will uh, carefully track uh, military uh, developments and uh, uh, installations, if you will, in Syria, particularly as they affect the coalition. Uh, operations, but uh, the one thing I would point out is that uh, uh, this is a system. Uh, last I checked, the Russians said that their primary goal was to to fight extremism, uh, ISIL and uh, Nusra, in Syria, and uh, neither one has an air force. Um, so I would uh, question just what the purpose of the system is, if they're installing. Maybe the Russians have a better explanation. What's your understanding of what type of system it is? Um, I, I'll leave it to the Russians to describe what they've saw. My understanding, they had a public announcement today about a. The U.S. has not seen this missile system. Uh, I'll just leave it to the Russians to describe the the equipment that they're bringing into Syria. They apparently had an announcement this morning. Bill, there is, if, there, if the system Sorry. did come in, how concerning is that for the U.S. military with U.S. planes flying in Syria? Well, we obviously have, we want to monitor. Uh, these kinds of systems and the, what they, the implications are for the coalition aircraft. We continue to have uh, take every step that we can to ensure the safety of our air crews flying over Syria. Uh, that is something we take very, very seriously, as I think you all know. We continue to maintain uh, the deconfliction channel with uh, uh, the memorandum of understanding with regard to safety of flight. Uh, with the Russians, which we think is important to maintain, even as we have these disagreements with the Russians, because we think it's in not only the coalition's interest, but also Russia's interest, to maintain that line of communication with regard to safety. And uh, so we'll continue to, to use that uh, as appropriate. Um, and uh, uh, again, we, this is something that we take very, very seriously, the safety of our air crews, and we'll continue to do so. Problem in Russia? Uh, let, me, let me go to someone who has another question. I'll come back. Andrew? Um, yeah, on, on Tammy's question, I mean, is, is it fair to say whatever the details of the system that they're bringing in, if it is a sophisticated and powerful surface-to-air missile system, I mean, wouldn't uh, the secretary and others in the building consider that to be uh, a, a, a threatening move? I mean, there's only a few sets of aircraft flying in Syrian airspace, as you point out yourself. Um, wouldn't that pose a wouldn't bring that kind of system into that theater pose a risk to U.S. aircraft and U.S. pilots? Well, if, it depends on how the Russians uh, plan to use it, but we certainly have. Uh, uh, again, we want to continue to uh, maintain that uh, uh, deconfliction uh, channel with the the Russians to make sure that uh, they know how serious we are about maintaining the safety of our air crews, and uh, and as you point out, the. ISIL doesn't have an air force, and neither does Nusra, uh, which are the two groups that the Russians have said they're uh, most concerned about. So this is something we'll watch carefully, but uh, it should be clear to the Russians and everybody else operating in Syria how seriously we take uh, the safety of our air crews, uh, coalition air crews, I should point out. Are you saying that that poses a risk to the U.S. aircraft and forces operating in the area, or it, it doesn't pose a risk to those? U.S. aircraft forces operating the area. Uh, I'll leave it to the Russians to describe why they brought the system in there, but uh, I'd just say that we uh, continue to do everything we can to ensure the safety of our coalition air crews, and we will continue to do so. And uh, those air crews as well, I should point out, uh, have the inherent right to self-defense. And uh, uh, so far we've been able to deconflict operations over Syria through the Memorandum of Understanding. Um, in the midst of our disagreements with Russia, that has successfully been able to avoid misunderstanding and miscalculation, we certainly would uh, expect uh, that we can continue to avoid any misunderstanding or miscalculation. Yes. I'm sorry. I was going to call on Bill before. Bill? Thank you. Um, the HVI strike that you uh, announced last night? Yes. Um, does this indicate a wider effort against uh, Nusra in Syria? <clears throat> um, this is, uh, Bill, the individual we targeted. Uh, as you know, and as we spelled out in the release, is someone that uh, has been part of Al Qaeda for some time. Uh, someone who uh, was uh, among the senior leaders of Al Qaeda. 
And uh, it is not the first time we've targeted al Qaeda leadership in Syria. And so it represents a continuation of our counterterrorism efforts, uh, particularly focused on, on al Qaeda leadership. But he's also a co founder of Nusra. It seems like you're taking great pains to say that he wasn't part of Nusra. So uh, he's part of uh, you, whatever group you want to uh, say he was part of. We know he was part of al Qaeda. Well, and that's that, been. I guess the, the larger question is, is well, why aren't we striking Nostra? Uh, we're targeting uh, terrorist leaders, um, particularly those affiliated with uh, Al Qaeda, uh, because that's been a goal of the U.S. government since uh, 2001. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. And uh, again, we are uh, identifying this was an individual who has um, uh, been part of external plotting. Uh, outside of Syria, including in targets uh, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, this was a, a target that we felt um, was appropriate to take, given the threat uh, he and uh, uh, al-Qaeda as a group uh, continues to pose to the United States. Yes, Jenny. Um, recently, uh, United States Congress has stated that uh, the missile system should be in a place as soon as possible in South Korea. How fast this process is going to more along? Uh, I know that the, the hope is to deploy the THAAD system as, as uh, quickly as feasible uh, in order to substantially improve the missile defense uh, in place for the Republic of South Korea, and we'll be working very closely, as you know, we have been, Jenny, with the Republic of South Korea um, with regard to installing that system as quickly as possible, but I don't have a particular uh, date for its uh, completion. Well, my, uh, Secretary Carter, uh, listen, uh, he mentioned about uh, nuclear deterrent. <coughs> so what is the exactly uh, the nuclear deterrent, how they can use for, for if North Korea using nuclear first? then U.S. can use nuclear. I, I think you, you've heard the Secretary speak uh, often, and he spoke uh, most recently uh, on our trip visiting U.S. Uh, nuclear facilities uh, and uh, part of the nuclear enterprise here in the United States. Uh, and I think he made clear our view of uh, the importance of the nuclear deterrence, maintaining that deterrence, uh, not just uh, for the United States, but for um, our allies as well. And uh, it's something that he feels uh, strongly about, and it's something that's been U.S. policy for some time. And uh, uh, North Korea and others should realize that that deterrence um, is real and uh, will continue to be. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, Sam Woodrow with USNI News. Uh, today, uh, the president of the Philippines told uh, President Obama to go to hell, uh, threatened to break up with America. Uh, and uh, has consistently thrown out some messages that are uh, kind of in diametric opposition to what the Defense Department says is an ironclad relationship with, with the Philippines. Um, the DOD announced a program for $42 million in investment into maritime domain awareness. It's making a, 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 a pretty big deal of um, the enhanced defense cooperation agreement with the Philippines, but you have a head of state that is making some pretty severe claims uh, and some pretty intense statements uh, as to the relationship with the United States. Has the Pentagon or the administration or anyone received any kind of notification from the Philippines as of yet as to sort of their commitment with U.S. defense agreements going forward? Uh, is there any reaction from the Secretary or any reaching out to, to his counterparts over in the Philippines to kind of clarify the situation? Because there's, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity in an area that's pretty pretty busy militarily. Uh, as you may know, the Secretary just met with uh, his Philippine counterpart uh, in Hawaii as part of the uh, ASEAN Defense Ministers Informal that the Secretary just hosted, spoke uh, with uh, uh, Secretary Lorenzana uh, during the course of those uh, meetings. Um, he had a good and productive conversations with, uh, with his counterpart. 
Um, and what I would just uh, refer you to is, again, what the Secretary's uh, said and what we've been saying for some time, and that is we have a 65-year alliance relationship uh, with the Philippines. Uh, we have shared con security concerns. We've had a history of cooperation on a range of uh, fronts, not just military, but also uh, with regard to humanitarian catastrophes. Um, and uh, we have uh, shared values with the Philippine people. And uh, we think those, that enduring relationship uh, is important. And uh, we're confident that that will continue. And we continue to work closely with uh, the Philippine military on a range of fronts. And, uh, and that's an alliance that uh, requires U.S. commitments and their commitments that we're going to meet. And uh, just to answer the first part of your question, I'm not aware of any uh, a specific change that's been uh, uh, that's been notified to us with regard to our military to military relationship. Carla. Um, on Somalia, just can you confirm that the U.S. has not conducted any strikes since the strike on September 28th? And then get us up to speed with where the Pentagon is on investigating this attack that the U.S. says killed nine Al Shabaab members and that some local Somali government officials are saying killed 13 members of local forces. I can tell you that there's uh, the reviews underway. I, I don't have anything more with regard to, to that review, and I'm not aware of any additional strikes since then. Um, but I'll check on that and try and get back to you. Yes, Dan. Uh, two, sort of a two-part question as it relates to Russia. Um, uh, first, um, on one hand, um, you, you've raised some questions, and you know, consistently, I think there's been a lot of questions raised about whether what Russia says and what Russia does matches. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you're referring us to Russian statements on what they're putting in country in Syria and things along those lines. Are those things kind of in conflict? I mean, can we really trust what that's what's being said there? I'll leave it for you to assess whether or not you can trust what the Russians are saying and doing in Syria. Okay. Uh, uh, second uh, point. Um, you, you've highlighted some inconsistencies that we've seen as well. Uh, second point, uh, Russia pulled out, uh, or set, indicated at least, that it will pull out of the uh, plutonium treaty uh, this week. Uh, mm -hmm. From a Defense Department perspective, from a military perspective, are there any second and third order effects uh, at this point in terms of discussions, what that means for the United States and the military? Yeah, I think the, the, the White House and State Department, I think, have weighed in on this already. This is a, a nonproliferation uh, agreement that uh, certainly the United States felt was uh, not only in the U U.S. interest, but also in, in Russia's interest. We're disappointed in their decision. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, immediate impacts on the Department of Defense uh, beyond, of course, uh, just the, the goal, uh, the President's goal, others' goal of uh, trying to reduce the amount of plutonium that might be out there um, uh, in the world and the, the threat that that poses. And uh, so, again, this was a, an agreement that uh, Russia had reached previously, and uh, we're disappointed with the, this decision. And uh, uh, I'll let my colleagues at the White House and State Department talk about the, the broader the treaty itself and the arrangement, the agreement that, that produced this. Um, but I, I think it's fair to say that we're disappointed with their decision. Lucas. You're going back to Syria. Has the White House made any specific requests to the Pentagon to prepare any kind of military action against the Assad regime? Uh, Lucas, I'm not going to get into uh, private conversations that uh, the leadership here is having or might be having with the, uh, the White House. You know that this is a, a conversation, that the situation in Syria is a, a, a very serious situation, and we have multiple things happening there. We've got the ISIL fight, which is, a, uh, again, we're continuing to make progress uh, against ISIL in Syria, as we are in, uh, in Iraq. That remains the primary focus of the Department of Defense, and the Secretary Carter in Syria is ensuring that ISIL has delivered a, a lasting defeat and does not continue to pose a threat uh, to the United States. And uh, that remains our primary focus. Um, we will continue to assess the broader situation in Syria. Uh, as you know, it's a complex situation, not only the civil war, but we've got uh, a number of players uh, on the ground in Syria, and uh, it's something we'll watch very carefully and continue to provide whatever counsel, uh, uh, advice, and uh, and options that uh, uh, that the president and his national security team need. Does the Pentagon need to wait for a specific request to start planning any kind of military we actions? We are a planning institution, Lucas. Uh, we do planning all the time. 
Earlier you mentioned on the hurricane relief that no specific request had come down to the Pentagon, but you were making preparations anyway to get these ships underway. I was wondering if the I, same thing applied to I have, I have learned in my short time in this building that we plan for a lot of things. Okay. Uh, and you can be sure that we are planning for a whole host of, of things, uh, as you would expect um, the senior leadership in this building to do. Uh, on a range of fronts. Does that include any kind of humanitarian aid drops to the citizens who are trapped, the hundreds and thousands of Aleppo citizens that are trapped uh, in the city? Well, you know, Lucas, that the United States has been the biggest contributor of humanitarian assistance, first of all, to the uh, people, the, people of the Syria. Russians and convoys, the we, there was an agreement uh, uh, that the Secretary Kerry, an arrangement that he had uh, negotiated to get uh, humanitarian assistance into places that uh, were in desperate need of that assistance. And you saw as well as anybody else that that assistance did not arrive. Uh, so we certainly would, uh, would continue to work with the United Nations. I'll defer to my colleagues at the State Department on this because they've been in the lead. The United Nations has been taking uh, the lead in terms of trying to provide humanitarian assistance to the people of Syria who desperately need it. We're very supportive of that effort. Um, and at this point, uh, it's, it's a question of access for those UN uh, uh, convoys, which, to my understanding, they may still be in the in the region. Uh, that getting access to that uh, that assistance is what's most important, and that's something that's going to have to be determined by actions of people on the ground, and that includes uh, most notably the the regime and their uh, Russian supporters. If the United Nations asked the U.S. government to help get those aid convoys into Aleppo, would the Pentagon help out with that? Of of course, we do what. Uh, whatever the commander-in-chief asked us to do. Uh, this is, a, I'm sure, a conversation that, again, uh, my colleagues at the State Department are having on a regular basis. Um, we stand ready to, to assist in whatever way we can. Um, to my knowledge, those requests have not come. So, yes, Paul? Peter, just to follow up on that, uh, last week, Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken was asked before, I think it was Senate Foreign Relations, on what the plan B is. The implication is that the diplomacy is on the verge of crumbling, what is the U.S. Plan B? And when he was pressed uh, for an answer, among his responses was that there's been a new round of options given to the president. His, his term was some old, some new. Just follow up on what, Lu on what uh, Lucas was asking. Is, is, is the Defense Department considering any new military options for operations in Syria that it wasn't considering previously? Uh, Paul, again, I'm not going to get into uh, internal deliberations between uh, uh, the White House, the national security leadership, and what's going on. I think what uh, Secretary Blinken indicated, Deputy Secretary Blinken, was that uh, a range of options were being assessed, not necessarily uh, military. We're still, still talking about uh, diplomatic, other steps that can be taken by the whole of the, the U.S. government. This is a very serious, dangerous, and tragic situation in Syria. And obviously, given in light of the uh, light of the, the collapse of these talks with the the Russians uh, over a cessation of hostilities, that uh, uh, I think uh, what he was referring to was a, a reassessment of what our next steps will be. And I think that's we obviously the secretary would be part of that conversation going forward. The context was in consequences, which would either be probably military or, or economic. Um, can you can you say whether this cessation of the d the diplomatic process has led to an intensification of looking for more options instead of the Defense Department's usual tempo of always having options to provide? Has this led to a new call from the president to I'm, ask for I'm alternatives? Not, I'm not going to characterize our our tempo or pace. Um, we will continue to provide uh, the advice and counsel that the. Uh, the president and his national security team need in terms of uh, the situation on the ground in Syria, uh, both as it relates to the civil war and as it relates to, to ISIL. Um, I, I really want to emphasize that our primary focus remains the fight against ISIL, which is taking up a substantial part of what's happening in Syria. Uh, and we will continue to focus our efforts on that front, even as uh, the State Department and the United States government as a whole continues to to uh, do what we can to try and, and alleviate the suffering of the Syrian people in the civil war. Uh, but our focus remains right now, Paul, on, on the, the ISIL fight and delivering ISIL a lasting defeat. Yes, Peter, Thomas. Um, just 
going back to some of the earlier questions about the uh, missile system that's now in place um, in Syria. Operationally, I, I understand your point about the you guys continuing to deconflict and so on with the Russians. Operationally, does this change anything for U.S. Our, our operations will continue. Okay. Um, with the with the S four hundreds that were put in place last year in November and now this, does it appear? Would it be your military assessment that Russia is appearing to be ready to perhaps declare its own uh, no fly zone? Uh, you'd have to ask the Russians what it is they're planning to do with these systems. They have installed systems that have certain capabilities. Uh, we have uh, an air campaign that we're waging in Syria, uh, and we're going to continue to uh, wage that air campaign. They can explain to you or try and explain to you what it is that system's for, but as we noted before, uh, the two groups that they say they're most concerned about, uh, ISIL and uh, Nusra, don't operate air forces. So uh, we'll leave it to the Russians to explain what they're doing there. Without trying to get into hypotheticals, but if they did, if they did um, declare such a th zone, would that affect anything U.S. did operationally? I I'm not going to get into hypothetical situations. Watch the time. You've got two yeah. Okay. So I got time for one more here. Uh, just two quick follow-ups. One on Thomas's. I beg your pardon. Um, in the past, I'm sorry, Tara. In the past, the, um, we've, everybody's been allowed to ask one question. I've noticed that people here have been asking it's upwards of seven's question. No, you, you just said it was the last question. I'll, so. I'll get to you as well. Nancy. Thank you. Um, so is it the Pentagon's understanding that the S-400 system is still in Syria, which is a more advanced system than the S-300? Uh, I'll leave it to the Russians to tell you where, where their systems are and, and what, they're, what they're doing. They have air defense systems uh, in uh, Syria. We've uh, seen them. Uh, if they've made uh, adjustments today, uh, I'll leave it to the Russians to explain what the, uh, what the rationale is behind that. Um, Quick, because I promised to get to Nancy. A few minutes ago, uh, you know, the Pentagon is in the business of planning. With everything that's happened with the Philippines of late, um, are alternative plans being made to perhaps reposition some of the U.S. commitments to uh, rebuilding sites or doing humanitarian locations um, if U.S. efforts are not are no longer wanted by the Philippines, or is it just a wait and see approach and see if maybe Duterte's comments are more bluster than they are? Uh, you know, fact. We, uh, we're not making any changes at this point to the EDCA agreement, and we'll continue to work closely with uh, the Philippine government in terms of implementing it, and of course our larger alliance relationship. We are, we're allies, um, and we'll continue to have our conversations as appropriate with, uh, with our Philippine counterparts. Nancy. Um, I wanted to follow up on a few things you mentioned earlier. To Bill's question about the uh, high-value target that was possibly killed, that you announced yesterday. Um, my understanding in your answer is that this department sees a difference between Nusra and Al-Qaeda. Is that correct? You should take from my answer that we targeted an individual who is a member, a legacy member of Al-Qaeda, and we targeted that individual because uh, that person has posed a, a threat to the United States and because we've been uh, well documented our efforts to go after Al-Qaeda wherever they may be. and. This individual was in Syria. But legacy Al Qaeda suggests then that you see a difference between. I'm just trying to understand for clarity. We if you see a we've targeted people who are members of Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda affiliates, and in this instance, this is someone we know has had a long history with Al Qaeda. Would you carry out similar targets potentially against Nusra targets? We would target people who are, uh, again. Uh, as part of our authorization for the use of uh, force against Al Qaeda, anyone who's part of an Al Qaeda affiliate. And as you know, Nusra has been uh, a very public affiliate of Al Qaeda for some time. Um, and then on Aleppo, does the Secretary see a distinction between what is happening there and the fight against the Islamic State in terms of um, mission, if you will? Does he make a distinction between? the instability in Aleppo and the ability for groups like the Islamic State to continue to operate um, in places uh, around the Middle East? I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you see a distinction between the instability in places like Aleppo and the ungoverned space and the war against the Islamic State, or does he see them as interrelated? Well, I think the Secretary does see the, the fight against the Islamic State in Syria as distinct from the, the civil war itself and the effort by uh, opposition groups uh, to try and uh, and uh, deal with uh, 
uh, a, a civil war that has caused so much suffering and pain for the Syrian people and uh, and because we have a regime uh, in Syria that uh, no longer has the legitimacy to govern and he sees that there's a, a political and diplomatic solution to what's going on in the civil war. He does not see a political or diplomatic solution to the Islamic, uh, uh, to ISIL. Um, there's a military solution and that's the one we're carrying out. And then on the um U.S. troop death in Afghanistan. He, as I understand it, he was uh, part of a mission that was confronting ISK. Is that correct? Yes. And he was getting combat pay. Um, I, I, this was an uh, individual serving in Afghanistan. I'm not sure the exact uh, nature of his compensation, but I. Members in Afghanistan are not getting combat pay. I, I don't believe so, but I can check that for you. Is he eligible for combat awards at the Purple Heart? Um, I'll, I'll check that as well. Um, Again, this was someone who uh, was serving his country in a counterterrorism mission in Afghanistan, targeting ISIL, and uh, uh, was doing so bravely and honorably and uh, on behalf of his country. And we should all remember that uh, today on a very difficult, tragic day for this department. I'm just having a hard time understanding why this department continues to make a distinction between serving in combat, as you put it, a combat situation, a combat-related difficult situation. I just, for... I think it would be helpful for the public to this understand was, uh, why, we can't, why this department is reticent to say that he was serving in combat. I'm, I'm just having a hard time understanding the, the need for such a distinction. Uh, Nancy, we've talked about this many times. This was a very dangerous situation. This was certainly a U.S. service member in harm's way conducting a counterterrorism mission against uh, a, a, a foe that has presented a clear threat to the United States. Uh, and uh, he was... Uh, this individual was carrying out that mission. Uh, as you know, in Afghanistan, we have a broader uh, two separate missions. We have a counterterrorism mission. We also have a separate effort to try and uh, support uh, the Afghan government, the Afghan National Security Forces, in which they are in the lead for the security of their own country. We are providing enabling, train, advise, and assist a support, very different from the kind of mission we were carrying out in Afghanistan previously, as you know when we had a significantly higher number of troops in which they were in the lead. Uh, so you have to draw the distinction between those two missions. This person was carrying out uh, part of our counterterrorism mission, working alongside Afghan forces, because ISIL is, of course, a threat uh, most prominently in Afghanistan to the Afghan people and to the Afghan government. Uh, and this is a tragic situation in which we uh, did suffer a casualty today. Uh, and you can call it, this was uh, someone who was in harm's way, a combat situation, to be sure. Uh, but I think you have to draw a distinction between our mission in Afghanistan today and what we were doing, say, even five or ten years ago. So, I, I, this has got to be quick because I'm, I'm the nine secretary minutes late. Do you believe that Aleppo's days are numbered? Um, uh, the secretary obviously sees the pain and suffering going on in Aleppo, sees uh, the results of indiscriminate bombing in Aleppo, and has the very same concerns that you've heard. Uh, expressed from throughout uh, the U.S. government. This is a very dire situation uh, and one that we think uh, requires uh, action from the international community, certainly from those uh, from the regime and from its uh, supporters. Um, they have an opportunity to change the outcome in Aleppo. They have an opportunity to address the humanitarian situation in Aleppo. Uh, we have not seen them uh, in a forthcoming fashion uh, do what is right uh, in Aleppo to try and ease that suffering of the Syrian people, and we certainly wish uh, that they would make, take advantage of that opportunity. Thanks, everybody.